everyone. I'm Laura Sparks, president of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Thank you so much for joining us. I am just delighted to be hosting tonight's conversation with acclaimed writer, director, and Cooper alumna, Patty Jenkins. We have an absolutely spectacular evening ahead of us, starting with a behind the scenes look at Patty's latest film, Wonder Woman 1984. We're also very excited this evening to welcome Gal Gadot, star of the Wonder Woman trilogy. Gal will join Patty in a, a little later to talk about their work together um, before we open it up for a Q&A with Patty and some questions from the audience. Uh, but first, let me welcome all of you. I know we have a number of Cooper Union alumni watching tonight as part of our annual Cooper Together programming. Thank you so much for being here um, each year. At this time, Cooper Together is a way to celebrate our alumni community around the globe. Traditionally, we gather in person around the world this year via online screens to reconnect with the broader Cooper community and to commemorate our institution's founder, Peter Cooper, who opened the doors of his institution in 1859 with really the conviction that equal access to education is at the heart of a flourishing democratic society. The Cooper Union is a small but mighty college among the nation's very best for students pursuing degrees in architecture, art, and engineering, and who are really committed to questioning the status quo, to pushing boundaries in search of a better world. Since the very beginning, more than 160 years ago, the Great Hall of the Cooper Union has provided a platform for advancing Peter Cooper's vision through free public programs that educate, that entertain, that inspire, and spark civic discussion around important issues. Though our Great Hall public programs have moved online this year as a result of the pandemic, I think Tonight's program would be right at home in the tradition of countless exceptional, creative, fierce women who have taken the Great Hall stage over the years. Suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, activists like Bella Abzug and Gloria Steinem, writers like Susan Sontag and Zadie Smith, and artists and performers like Judy Chicago and Lori Anderson, all of them real life heroes in their own right. But for many young girls who grew up watching Linda Carter on TV, and now for a new generation, there is perhaps no more iconic heroine than Wonder Woman. And in a movie industry dominated by male superheroes, the success of a woman-directed blockbuster film franchise that not only portrays a woman as the protagonist, but does so in such a fun, smart, and powerful way is nothing short of inspiring. Our guests tonight are two incredibly talented women who have given new life to this character. And I am so thrilled to be moderating our conversation with them. So let's meet our featured guest this evening. Patty Jenkins is a writer and director and best known for directing the Wonder Woman trilogy. She is a graduate of the Cooper Union School of Art and began her career as a painter before transitioning to the film industry. She spent eight years as an assistant camera person focused fuller on commercial and music videos before writing and directing her first feature film, Monster, starring Charlize Theron in 2003 after attending the AFI in Los Angeles. With Wonder Woman in 2017, Patty became the first female director of an American studio superhero movie, which also became the highest grossing film ever directed by a woman. And she has recently been announced as the first woman to direct a Star Wars feature film. Rogue Squadron is expected in theaters in 2023. Patty, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I, I have to share a quick anecdote about you, one that you and I connected with a little bit earlier just before this, um, that you know, you told me when we first met in Los Angeles, um, you said you remembered early on in your time at Cooper being on Astor Place, 
just outside of Cooper's Foundation Building and you were looking up at the enormous sculpture, the cube, and saying to yourself, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but I know it's going to be big. I know it's going to be big. Clearly, uh, you were on to something that day because here we are. Um, and I want to get to our conversation if we're ready to get started. So thank you again so much uh, for being here. So happy to be here. So excited. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. And, you know, this school is a place that I'm really passionate about. I'm so grateful for the incredible education I got here. And so, you know, so happy to be back here having a conversation. Thank you. Well, you are making us proud every day. Um, so I watched an interview with Pedro Pascal, who played Maxwell Lord in the film and was really the human embodiment of all things um, excess of the 80s. And he mentioned how you really set the stage for your actors to explore all corners of their character and take risks and that you fight for all of these things to be in the final edit. Why is that so important to you? Well, it's interesting when you think about the different mediums of, of, of the arts, um, really, when it comes to storytelling, film should be ultimately the most sophisticated of all of them. You know, that's where we should end up. Why? Because we have all of our, our sight and sound, you know, versus a novel. However, clearly we're, we're very far behind what's happened in literature. So I've always been challenging myself to say, so why is that? And what's missing? And I think, you know, you have to look at film as a young art form. It's, it's, it's really just a little more than a hundred years old, really 120 years old. So um, one of the things that I think is so important is we as animals read so much information that you could not quite put your finger on in the world. And one of them is character detail where in your, you don't need someone to tell you their backstory when you're walking down the street in New York to have a snapshot where you know so much about a person. So to me, it's not just because I love actors, even though I really do. It's because what you and an actor can do together is so powerful to the experience of the audience watching a film where there's what you can get into the script and then there's what you can actually bring to life in their performance, in their inner life, in their clothing choices, in how they walk. So I'm like really fascinated with those details on all kinds of filmmaking. So what that means is I end up getting really down deep into it with the actor. And then once they're becoming that person, any little detail that they're able to add and, and feeling that they're able to get, I mean, you have to follow the script, but it's like what that life, what that coming to life is, is incredible. You know, it's an incredible thing to capture. And so that's the sport of filmmaking that that's one of my favorite parts of the sport of filmmaking is working with an actor on that exact part of it. Is there, a, is there a particular shot or sequence that you had to fight for in the final cut of 1984? Yeah, I, I don't know. I was very supported by Warner Brothers, so it's not like I had to fight for it, but definitely the one that they, you know, they have a lot of faith in me and we're, we're great collaborative partners. I think the one that was, that took faith from beginning to end, and I'm sure that a lot of people were very nervous about, was the flight through fireworks because that's the kind of scene that is nothing until it's something at the very end. You're talking about shooting against a green screen with nothing and no music and not the right score. And so, and what is really happening with the plot and what ends up happening is in the you know year and a half that you're in post, everybody's like, I felt like this part could be cut. And you're like, yeah, of, co of course this part can be cut right now because it's, it's, it's not at all resembling what it can be if we have faith in it a year and a half from now. And so, Scenes like that, where they're not necessarily just about moving the plot forward, but but where they're about an emotional experience and a beautiful moment, there those are always hard because you know people want to make film shorter and stuff. But in this case, that that scene in particular was brutally brutally challenging for people to really see and understand until the very end. You shot both Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 1984 on film, something that um, I think is quite unusual for films of this scale. What informs that approach? Why is that your preferred medium? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's interesting. There's an assumption nowadays 
because the digital medium has come so far and it has come so far. But there is an assumption that the people who are still clinging to uh, shooting on film are, are being Luddites or resistant to change. I find it to be the exact opposite. It's actually, um, once you really get into the specifics, not unlike photography, like once you get into the specifics of what you can get with your tools, you know, as an artist who's, who's trained to observe the finest details of things, the truth is what you get on film is different. And so what I find to be the most incredible about shooting on film, particularly in this kind of, of film where you need to go to a, a, a third reality, you don't want it to look like you're in the real world. It has to have that little veneer is that shooting on film seals that veneer in. And as we all remember from watching movies in the past where you would really have fantasy, oftentimes now in digital spaces, it, it can accidentally look like you're in like a, your friend's camcorder. Like you can just see too, much, too many of the scenes, too much of the detail of the yeah. fake scenes, too much of the, well, the second you shoot on film, boom, there's a wall, just like great photography. Like think about fashion photography. There's an otherworldly veneer between you and that model and the illusion that's being put forth that you also can achieve by shooting film and working as carefully in, in a big blockbuster. I think that people are making the mistake, and I see it happening in fashion photography too, where they're shooting digitally and suddenly I'm seeing just a human being standing on a, on a backdrop. It, I, I, the illusion is going away. So that the, the emulsion is, is a powerful tool. Building on that and, and kind of taking it in a, in a slightly different um, direction, your set design in this film literally transports viewers back to 1984. What was it like bringing that decade back to life? It was pretty incredible. There were certain, a lot of it was just really fun and Aline Bonetto, our production designer, is a, is a genius and amazing. Um, but then there were some things like we rebuilt this entire mall and populated it with stores from the 80s. So standing in that mall was like going back in time for me. And there was, it was interesting what it triggered because I remember leaving at the end of many days, but definitely leaving at the end, there was some part of me that really encapsulated what I was trying to do with this movie that I didn't want to go because I remembered how good that naivete felt when it felt like this could go on forever and that there was no price, you know? And I remember leaving the mall and being like, oh, it's like your your youth your youthful belief of what the world could be so lived then and now we know like you just can't live your life that way and so moving on to the more uh, jaded understanding of of the world of the current day was a little sad every day. <laughs> so you know contrast that like I I still remember when I watched. Um, the film for the first time, you know, I was so gripped by that opening scene, right? Wonder Woman 1984 opens with this incredible scene of the Amazonian Olympics, um, very different in feeling from what we were just talking about. Can you give us a sense of how that was shot and, and how you thought about that contrast? Yeah, that was, we always think of, of Themyscira as your ideal civilization. So Themyscira has evolved at the same, at the same rate as man's world, but in just a different way, because they're just doing things slightly differently and they've solved problems slightly differently. So we always look to make Themyscira feel, I always say you want it to be a, a place where you're like dying to go on vacation. Like, what, what is that? I want to go there. What is that place? Mm -hmm. And then always the interesting challenge of, so what would that be? If there was a culture where every single, you know, every single person there was a woman, how would that, how would their, their culture evolve slightly differently? And what would those differences be? And likewise, these Olympic games, which are a famous part of the Wonder Woman lore, and we didn't get to do in the first film, it, it was a wonderful thing to get to finally bring them to life. And then ask ourselves, what would they want to see? What would these, these Amazons who were, who were born to teach the world love and kindness, but also incredibly fierce in, in battle and, and in all of these skills, what would their Amazon games look like? And so, you know, really the competition between, the healthy competition between them, but doing, uh, doing things that, that end up employing all of the skill sets they need, swimming, archery, running, horseback riding, you know, all of those things at the same time was something that was really fun to design how, how that would work and incredibly difficult to shoot. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, right? The, 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 the technical aspects that led you to this 
a film on this scale. And I, I know you've said it was so important that this film and the one before it use as little CGI as possible. Another pretty bold, unusual move. Um, what was that like on a film of this magnitude? It was incredibly challenging, be wonderfully rewarding, but incredibly challenging. So back to the same point that I was talking about why I shoot on film. Likewise, if what we're doing is investigating how to move the art form forward, we are getting so much emotional uh, mileage out of watching real human bodies doing things. There's a reason why you go to Cirque du Soleil and it's awe-inspiring. Whereas if I redid Cirque du Soleil in CG, it would not be something worth watching. You know, and so what is that? Like, what is that amorphous difference when you know that you're watching a real human body fly through the air? And so sequences like them all, there's not one digital double or CG component to it other than the lasso and taking out wires. Every single move in there is a real human being flying through the air up four stories, sliding along the floor. And so you know, I believe in the value of that and the spectacle of that. And it, what it means is you're, you're laboriously um, but thrillingly designing wire rigs that have never existed before and pushing the boundaries of what wire rigs can do. And so, you know, we had some of the best people in the world. We had the best wire, wire rig people in the world working with our incredible uh, stunt coordinator to, to design these things. And it means you're shooting for long, long periods of time and people like Gal are jumping off balconies and flying down three floors and it's terrifying and difficult. <laughs> So I know we have, um, I, I think we have quite a few aspiring filmmakers uh, tuning in and I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you, you blend these worlds with what people think about as sort of future technologies for filmmaking and yet realizing there's so much in um, the, the way filmmakers have done things to date that is still not, not just relevant, but can really make the film. I'm curious what you have to say to some of those aspiring filmmakers as they build their own um, sort of portfolios of skills and, and make their way through this really interesting kind of technically complex world. I think it's such an exciting time because of the, the films that people are able to make now. When I was younger, getting your hands on a camera was such a difficult thing. And now uh, what is what is available is incredible. I would say um, my biggest piece of advice, my biggest piece of advice along those lines is to be so excited about all of the opportunities that you have and don't be beholden to impressing yourself in the way that the system has worked before. Put your eyes on the screen. Put all of your focus and all of your efforts onto the screen and making the experience that you want to happen happen in any which way you can do it, even if you're doing it with your phone. Um, and then, and then, but but also like like think about the emotional impact of what you're doing too. And, and what do you want people to feel when they're watching something and are you doing it? Because I think that that's what's led me to many of the most specific and important choices in my career was observation of like, that's funny, you can do it this way, but I don't feel anything. But now a real human being does something. Oh, now I feel something. That's interesting, you know? And so focusing on not just what you're looking at, but what you want things to, what you want the take home impression to be as well. That's great. Thank you. I know, um, you know, young people as they're making their way through all of this have, have, you know, sort of like, do you latch on to what's of the moment? And, and yeah. uh, it, it's really, I think, helpful to hear that. So I now want to turn to the next part of our evening by inviting a very special guest to join the conversation. Hi. Gal, a second, let me see. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Gal Gadot is an Israeli actress, producer, and model known for portraying Diana Prince, Wonder Woman, in the DC Extended Universe and for her role in the Fast and Furious franchise. Time Magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2018. Gal, we are so grateful that you could join us this evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Gal. Hi, Jax. And he told me all about you guys and what you're doing is amazing. And I'm just happy that I can contribute to, you know, the wonderful work that you're doing out there. 
Oh, well, we are so incredibly grateful. You are, as you know, such an inspiration to so many young girls and women and men around the world. And we are so glad that you could carve out um, a piece of what I know is incredibly precious um, commodity of time <laughs> to, spend, to spend with us. Um, so, you know, Patty, you said that when you were growing up, Wonder Woman was the first female superhero your generation was really able to engage with. And I'm wondering if both of you could share your hopes for what a new generation will gain from your reimagination of this iconic superhero. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I, so, so beautiful. I, I, I remember so clearly what, um, what it was like when Wonder Woman first arrived in the world. You know, there was something so absolutely captivating about particularly for girls, not having, ha if you liked superheroes, not having had a version of it yet, that was your wish fulfillment for who you would be in the future, who could be powerful and make a difference in this world and do incredible things and look like Linda Carter while you're doing it, you know? <laughs> so there was something so, so exciting about, um, about everything she stood for. And then, and then even just the legacy of what Wonder Woman stands for in the world, being so different in the fact that she stands for love and, and was never, um, in that generation of it was never uh, cold or mean or hard or violent for the sake of violence. And there's something so beautiful about that. Gal and I talk about it all the time. It's interesting, what, are, what were superheroes created for? They were created as wish fulfillment for people who felt powerless in the world. But also what were they, what were they facing in the 40s? They're post-World War II. So killing the bad guy and doing it in an incredible way was, was the name of the game. But that's not our world anymore. Now our world is very, very different. I think we all know better than to think that there's one bad guy and the world is going to be better. So there's no superhero more uh, important to that to me than Wonder Woman. Because what do we need now? We need thoughtfulness, compassion, a love of mankind, forgiveness, and love, you know, in order to, to heal the world and ourselves. And so Gal and I talk about it all the time. We believe in it like a mission of like definitely making a movie for all ages, but particularly trying to inspire younger people to find the hero inside of them, you know? And so that's, that's you know, I, I hope I didn't just answer all of it for, for you too, Gal, but that's- okay, The only thing that I can add to it, I completely agree with you, um, is that we hope that this, this is gonna, you know, just like the first Wonder Woman that we made was, was thankfully so successful that it kind of ignite a female-led movement movies for many more to come. So we kind of managed to open the gate and show everybody, look, a superhero female-led movie can, can make great box office and be a great movie. Um, so I hope that the legacy of all this philosophy that Patty is talking about is going to last long and, 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 and have a true impact for generation. Just like Patty was affected by, by the Linda Carter Wonder Woman show, I, I wasn't born then, then, so all I had was really... You know, when I was told I'm being cast for Wonder Woman and, and Zack Snyder back then asked me, do you know who she is? I was like, uh, duh, I know who she is. I know of her. I don't know much about her. So I hope that, you know, in, in, in a decade or two or three from now, people are going to be so familiar with these amazing characters and, and everything that they stand for. So just building off of that um, a little bit, because I think, um, you know, really thinking about what what this means to, to have a female superhero today is, is so important. And, you know, I've read interviews, Patty, where you have called Gals Wonder Woman um, a new kind of hero. And that what the films have really been about is the pursuit of, as you said, a better, more loving, more thoughtful, more just humankind. Um, and that's a theme that I think is so central to what we're really trying to do at the Cooper Union. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, you talked about it kind of out in the world. I'm curious why it's important to both of you on a personal level. And Gal, you've talked about Patty having this sort of inner compass that infuses the work. And I'm wondering, you know, how that translates um, to your relationship as director and actor and to what audiences see on the screen. 
time do you have? <laughs> For the two of you, we have all night. <laughs> um, what was the first half of the question? So the first half, you really touched on it earlier, but just on a personal level, why is it so important to you that we have this new kind of superhero that is about love and compassion? Um, you know, I think, Patty, the, the observation that you made about, you know, the original Wonder Woman was sort of created in this other era um, where we were in the process of literally fighting the bad guy. And certainly there's still bad guys out there. But um, this notion that superheroes can and should be about love and compassion. And, I, you know, that, that obviously these movies resonate with both of you on a personal level. And I'm curious sort of what draws you to that, the importance of that. So I can say that, um, first of all, I think that these type of movies, they always like the, the a microcosmos in a, a, a very enhanced microcosmos to to the the life that we're living in the world right so you and 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 it's escapism and we exaggerate everything and there's monsters and there's bad guys and i think that where we are at and and this is something something that penny and i talk about a lot um we believe we're peace seekers much more than, you know, we're looking to fight. We believe in the plum, like we wanna show, we wanna set the example in an inspiring way. And we just sick of seeing the protagonist fights the monster and she wins the day. And this is that simple. Cause it's never that simple. Life is not that simple. And that's why in, in the movie that we made now, even the evil, even the villain you know, that we had in the movie, they weren't, you know, they were complex. We could, we could relate to them as an audience. We could understand where they were coming from. So I think that we, the new era of the Wonder Woman is also to kind of show that there are different ways and they're more sophisticated and they're more interesting and they're more progressed that we believe in. And as far as our relationship goes, you know, I remember the first time Patty and I met, um, it was in Atlanta in a really, really good sushi place. I'll give you the name if I ever remember. But we started talking, we just met, we knew we were going to do this movie together and we started talking about life and about, you know, our children and our aspirations and World War II. And like, we started to talk about the world and the philosophy of our lives and our values. And we see so much eye to eye that is just, I can't tell you how liberating it is as an artist to be, to feel that you're understood, that you, your vision is completely the same as the visionary of the film as the filmmaker that patty is and you know and then it just resonates to our lives because then it's just like we really get along together we really see similarly we see life in the same way um and it's the best patty did i completely still no, that was great that was great. And, and and I would only add to it, um, first of all, that I love working with Gal. <laughs> the greatest. Um, and then I, I would add just just to circle back to the beginning of the question, I actually don't believe that superheroes should be about love or need to be. I believe this superhero should be because that's what she was established to be. I think superheroes can do all kinds of good things in the world um, and that and and stand for all kinds of different things. The interesting thing is, is if what it is is to um, is to inspire people to find the hero in themselves, which is essentially what what comic books started by, is that you know you could feel powerless as a little kid, but you would read this thing, and in that thing you could stand up to the guy who kicked sand in your face. You know, if that's true, what are we facing now? We are facing serious crisis. And all of the serious crisis we're facing are going to require incredible complexity and change and uh, generosity of compassion. Like that's the truth of it. It's like we have to take responsibility for the world we've created. And we have a global world of different nations coming together all with different histories and agendas. So like 
it, it it's destructive to continue forth with the idea that if we kill everybody in that country, then everything's going to be okay. So I actually feel incredibly passionate about the fact that superheroes don't have to do this, but some superheroes really should do this because this is the message that the next generation needs to think about is like as gratifying as it would be to watch her kick somebody's ass. Um, is that really the, the hero? Is that the really the hero, heroic thing to be doing in this world right now? And so that's why I think we're so passionate about this character um, and, the, and the message uh, that she stands for. Um, it, it's, you know, it's so resonant as we, just, as we think about Cooper Union and the kinds of things we're trying to um, instill in our students as they go out into this world that is so complex, that is multidimensional, and there, there isn't a single lane solution for anything. I'm not sure there ever was, but especially now the intersection of, um, of technology and all of the complexity in the world. It's just, um, it's, it's important to think about these figures in that light. Um, character is so important. And Gal and Chris Pine, who plays Steve Trevor, have such a wonderful chemistry. Uh, Patty and Gal, what was it like introducing Kristen Wiig and Pedro Pascal, who played the film's villains, into the mix for 1984? So awesome. They, they, it was interesting. So Gal and Chris and I had such a rare and wonderful thing where we became super fast friends and the dynamics that you often see in the film are completely genuine when it would come to the fact that we would just be cracking up and laughing and making jokes and, and, and all of those things. Listen, I got to pick who I wanted to cast and I picked two people that I was a huge, huge admirer of and Pedro and I were already knew each other and had already worked together. Um, and Gal and I were both super fans of Kristen's. And so, you know, you're picking people that you already really like but we never could have known that they would, that, that they would fall into our group uh, as effortlessly, totally effortless. Do you remember any awkward transition? The only thing I remember, yeah. the only thing I remember at all was Kristen being on set the first day and you were being super goofy and comedians always have everybody trying to make them laugh. So I remember Kristen being like, oh, poor gal, is she trying to make me laugh? And I looked at Kristen and I go, this is what gals like all the time. <laughs> FYI, she's not doing this for you. You don't have to laugh. Gal is, is being hilarious. And like the second I remember Chris would be like, oh, oh my God. And then it was like off to the races. Like everybody was laughing and having a great time and from day one. Yeah, they were great. It was the smoothest. And we, I don't want to say nervous, but we were like kind of curious beforehand to know how it's, how this is going to work since we had such a great bond be between the three of us and Chris. Um, and I gotta say that it felt like they were always part of the Wonder Woman family. I mean, both of them are completely open and, 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 and funny and fun to be with and smart and at the same time like vulnerable and they'll share everything. Like they came with such an open heart and both Patty and I and Chris are kind of a people's people. We we just I admit, if you're that I'm immediately in love with you. I love to love people. I'm 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 that type of person. And it was just a celebration. I mean, sometimes, you know, we made it hard for Patty to direct us, and she had to play the bad cop and be like, "Okay, guys, this is enough. No, <laughs> this is not SNL. We're good at work." Uh, but it was the best. They're great, talented, fantastic people to work with and to be friends with. Mm -hmm. It seems like you guys are just making us feel bad that they're being kind of racist off the screen. Um, although I have to say, I'm kind of stuck on this, you know, sort of what makes the two of you um, work. There are so many iconic um, director-actor duos, Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, Nora Ephron and Meg Ryan, and now Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot. Um, there's there's been Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 1984 with the Wonder Woman 3 and Cleopatra still to come and we you know we've talked about sort of what makes your relationship work I'm, I'm curious how you think you complement one another I feel like that I is avatar I don't know how I compliment her <laughs> Oh my God, you gotta be kidding. I feel like Gal is an avatar 
of like my dream version of my fantasy better self. Like, <laughs> so I always feel like, like it's so, here's the funniest thing is that I, I really do, like we have had such an incredible experience of like sharing a single character. And sometimes like, I would joke that I would stand there and eat chocolate while we were shooting. Cause I was like, I don't care about me anymore. Like, look at her, she looks great, you know? <laughs> Just, um, but, but also, but also Gal is such a truly um, kinder than anybody I know, definitely myself, kinder, warmer, more, more loving, more patient, always so thoughtful and never, it, and it doesn't come from a place of naivete, it comes from wisdom. And so I think that, that her ability to bring that authentically and then talk about what I was saying before about what shows up on film like the 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 authenticity shows up on the film and everybody can feel it and they can feel that this is a good and kind person and a, and the subtlety of the performance that she's able to take on um yeah I mean and why I don't there's I, I honestly we've talked about it many times before I think it's it's absolutely incredible luck and even now we discover more all the time how much more we have in common because we've been bonded over Wonder Woman, but now we spend all this time together and we're like, God, we really are like so, so similar and well, well suited. It's, it's one of these rare, you know, cases where you really get to work with somebody who's like the best match for you. Yeah. I've never had this happen to me before to this extent. And it's on so many layers as well. And I feel like it's a mixture of like commitment. I feel like we're both super committed to each other and to the, like we're both there. It's not about us. It's about Wonder Woman. It's not about us. It's about the story. It's not about, and, and we're super committed to one another. It's like, you know, it's like basketball player. When I'm, when, when it's too much on me, these movies are very, very demanding when it's too much in me you know i pass the ball to petty and she she helps me out and and vice versa and i think that the elements of of trust and and you know and 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 commitment and bond that we have alongside with the fact that we believe we have a similar belief system is just like it just it makes it all easy you know, I could not ever imagine doing these movies without, with someone else. I can't, you know, it's, it's only Ajax and I love you. Amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about your next project, Cleopatra? We can't tell you much. We can tell you that it's uh, definitely in the works and it's, uh, and it's very, very, very exciting. And Lita uh, is working very hard on the script, but it's yet again another story that we're super excited to bring to the world. Yeah, I would say think about a legendary person and then think about the fact that the only version of her story you've ever heard was told by the Romans who executed her or didn't execute her but caused her death. And so the truth is the more uh, looking into it that we did, the more we found a very um, specific story. We're not gonna tell every single thing about her life, but that there's a lot of things I think were misunderstood in the context of her life. And so to actually tell the story of someone who was such an incredible person from a different point of view and to uh, simultaneously take advantage of the technology we have now to actually bring ancient Egypt back to life. Like how many of us don't want to see and walk through those streets and see the library in Alexandria and see, you know, we, we've never been able to do that before. And so how, what an incredible opportunity to finally be able to, to do that. Yeah. So, you know, Patty, you, you've said that you didn't set out though to make movies about strong feminist women, but as it turns out, your movies happen to have female leads because there are so many amazing stories about women that no one has told, to your point. Yeah. Um, you know, for both of you, who, who are the women whose stories you'd still like to tell, to, to share those stories with the world? I, I, you want to go? Do you? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so we're working on a bunch of them. So definitely, you know, Cleopatra is one of them. Hedy Lamar is another one that we're working on uh, getting made. 
uh, Lisa Howard, who was a journalist that uh, was basically the reason to why uh, she, she was, uh, how do you say this word now I'm blacking out. She was the middleman between America and Cuba during um, uh, the Cold War. And thanks to her, the war never broke. Um, there's many fascinating, there's Irena Sendler, who was a Polish woman, um, uh, a Polish Catholic woman that back in um, World War II managed to save essentially 2,500 children outside of ghetto Warsaw. There's many, like the more you, you dive in and, and, and search for stories, the more you know, surprised you get to learn that so many stories just was was ne you know were were never told. So I yeah, don't I would I would add to it when you think about the narrative of history, it's been told through a very limited lens, and I think that lots of groups of people are 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 having issues with that nowadays because. There's the version of the story told from one point of view and actually and I even remember somebody you know once saying to me that that well those stories are, are about that because those are the people who actually invented the things and you're like no the whole world's been being invented by everybody the whole time it's only the stories we've told so the truth is. I'm so excited for this new era of storytelling that all kinds of people can talk about our shared world and the different contributions all different kinds of people had. I mean, talk about going circling back to what I was saying in our previous conversation about how like, um, you know, film should be the most advanced art form of storytelling of all time, but we're not there yet. So if you look at literature and what you're able to do in literature, it should ultimately pale in comparison to what we're able to do in feature films. But if you think about how many books have been written about every single kind of person and life experience, you know, real and otherwise, versus the kinds of stories that have been told on film so far, and then you start looking back through the history of incredible people's stories. It's funny, I never, I don't think I go out of my way to only tell female stories, but as a woman, of course, they're, they're super appealing to me and they make perfect sense to me. And to me, I'm not telling a woman's story. I'm just telling a universal story, you know? And so, um, so I think that there, but once you do start looking, you're like, my God, a lot of these stories have never been told. How incredible. Yeah. Um, well, Gal, I know we have to let you go, and it's um, it's just been such a privilege for us not only to be able to spend time with you, but just to hear your insights about this character, about your career, and about all of the things that are ahead. I think um, we're all sort of sitting on the edge of our seat now, waiting to see you portray these um, incredible women in the incredible story. So again, I cannot thank you enough for being here with us tonight. I know my pleasure. My pure pleasure. Good luck to everybody. The sky's the limit. I'm so excited for you because you have your entire potential ahead of you. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Bye. 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 So I know, Patty, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. The list kind of keeps growing by the minute. So if, if it's OK with you, we'll go to those. Um, so the, the first one uh, from one of our audience members is, you know, this movie subverts the classic superhero villain trope, both the cheetah and Max Lord, uh, both cheetah and the cheetah and Max Lord are sympathetic characters. Um, can you share a little bit about how you decided to portray the human side of the, the villains? Yeah, no, I love that question. It's a great question. It's, um, it's an extremely purposeful effort that harkens back to what I was saying. I, I, I think the clock is ticking on our world as we know it. And I feel like if you're not contributing to trying to save it, then you're missing an opportunity, particularly when you have the ears of a you know, the eyes of, of the world, potentially, you know, not the whole world, but when you get an opportunity to make such a big movie like this, it's very hard to pass up that opportunity to not try to influence um, and contribute in some sort of positive way. And so, like I said, I think a lot of what we're facing is a global climate change, which we caused. And so how, how can we come to terms with the fact that, that we've all gotten our wish and getting our wish and we all are justified. We all have real reasons. I have great compassion for why we've wanted to be 
more glamorous and more cool and more mobile and more all of these things. But we really have to look at all of those things and 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 think about what is it costing you? You know, what is it costing you? Number one. Number two, we're dealing with globalization and the the way that we used to be able to look at the other by uh, vil vilifying them and, and having them at an arm's length and therefore having it be incredibly gratifying to kill them and defeat them is it has to change, you know, it just has to change. And so what I really set out to do was really subvert the genre by saying, okay, cool, look over here. I am hopefully giving you the, all of the things that you want and expect. There is action. There's even more action than there is in the first movie, but there is action, there is adventure, there is these things. But at the end of the day, what is it to be a hero right now? Like, what is it to be a hero? Like who who do we need to, to, to be brave enough to change? It's really ourselves. And, and it was really important to me that Wonder Woman, even Wonder Woman makes some mistakes, you know, like she, even she can't resist her temptation. That's because every single one of us, including myself is a part of the problem right now, you know? And so we all deserve compassion, but we also all have to be brave enough to face change and in order to save this world. So that, I started trying to design how do you tell a superhero movie that does all of those things and has a has a has a has a villain, but at the end deconstructs itself to say like be brave enough to see the truth like and 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 look at this world and look at how how are we going to save it, you know, so I set out to do to subvert it I I. I've never believed in anything more, you know, like I know that it was a harder it's a harder film to um, make and it's a harder film to succeed. But that doesn't matter. Like that, I'm, I'm not here to um, to. T I'm not here to not try to do the right thing myself either. You know, yeah. if I can't be inspired by uh, what I'm having the beautiful opportunity to represent right now, then what what am what are we doing? You know. Um. Yes. Yes. To all of that, and it's just so powerful to think about a a blockbuster movie like this with such intentionality around the both the social issues that we're confronting and also the just the humanity in all of that and, and the complexity in that humanity. Um, yeah. Our next audience question um, builds on that a little bit. How, how were you inspired by the creator of Wonder Woman and his interests in advancing women's rights? I think he had an incredible, to me, it really blows my mind how forward thinking he was and the two women that he lived with were uh, at that period of time, they were very involved in in women's rights and in uh, you know observing the suffragette mute movement. And um, what I love that they did that was so forward thinking was celebrate women for exactly what they are. Not that women need to change, and not that women need to change into men, and not you know. It was very much uh, uh, um, looking at the differences between men and women and celebrating them both, and not putting down men to do it either. You know, and so. That I think was so forward. I think that feminism is is about equality, right? And and from the very beginning, it was about equality. But it's it's definitely taken journeys at times where it was trying. There were certain people who were trying to prove that men, women were just like men, and there were some some hard times where, particularly in these action movies, the way to make a powerful woman was just to make a woman in a a, a, a man's role who happened to be being played by a woman. And so I think that like the 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 further way of feminism is to try to circle back to what he was originally doing, which was saying that that the deepest level of fe feminism is is actually acknowledging that we're equal already. <laughs> like we don't have to change, we don't have to do something different. We right. were always equal. We were right. always equal. And and there's different virtues in in all kinds. There's different virtues in all kinds of people. And 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 making everybody homogenous is not the answer. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I love about what what they were doing. Um. So I want to go to a question about um, mothers. And your your mom. I'm a mom. Um. In the first Wonder Woman film, Diana's mom was very protective of her. Um, why is it in Wonder Woman 1984, Diana participates in this um, in this gladiatorial game in the beginning? Like, what, what what drove that choice? So that is the 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 games the 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 Amazon games are a major part of the lore. They were always figured into her 
classic origin story before she leaves the island for the first time. We just literally didn't have time in the first movie and it was a major loss to lose the games because that was always how it had, you know, how it, how it, that story had gone. So I was always craving seeing it. Um, but uh, in this case, we, we both, I both just wanted to do it because it's great to see the Amazons again. Number two, I realized if you hadn't seen the first movie, it's very hard to have a context of who Wonder Woman is and where she comes from. But, um, but also lastly, I think that that important, the, the, the message of, of her experience there is something that she's not understanding yet. And it is really the, the message of the movie in great part, which is being a hero is not what you think. Like you come here to watch, Wonder Woman comes to that movie in the beginning and, she, and little Diana wants to kick ass and win. And that's going to make her win. And the message that that her aunt and her mother are saying to her is that's not what being a hero is like lying and, and taking a shortcut is not how you become a hero and actually a true hero is different than that you know and so by the end of the story our hero she wins the day by changing someone's point of view and with love and forgiveness and and she's not the stronger of the two when she fights Cheetah. Cheetah's stronger than her. So it doesn't matter that she's not the stronger one. And, and, and so the subtlety of all of her journey by the end of this film is that what, did it, what is it to truly be a hero? To be a true hero, the battle is internal and, and she has to f face the battle to make the choices she makes in the movie to do the right thing, you know? And that's really, she becomes a hero when she gives, the th gives things up. And, and and looks at herself, you know, and so that that was um, that was what that is framing. Okay, great. So we have a couple of questions about sort of looking forward. Um, so the first the first two films seem to be part of a quote, new sincerity art movement with a strong nostalgic element. Will the th with the third film apparently set in the present, will it pivot to um, be? postmodern or a more sincere undertone of metamodernism? They will always be sincere. I think that Wonder Woman is sincere and I don't take this, these filmmaking lightly. Like, and I, and I think that sincerity is missing in our world and it's the game that I've spent my whole life trying to figure out how to work with. And so um, it will always be sincere. I, I, uh, and I think that what, what, you know, go, just circling back to everything I've just been talking about, like if you're trying to really inspire people, if you're trying to make money and get successful, it's, it's, it's very cool to be insincere and funny and jokey and blah, 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 and make it easy viewing. If you're trying to, to actually truly influence people, you have to be a little more vulnerable than that, I think, and uh, try to get them to feel things deeply, you know? And so if, if in our movies we can give people moments that did for me what Superman 1 did for me when I saw it when I was a kid or Wonder Woman did for me when I watched her show, then that's the most important thing in the world. And so you can't get to those emotions without meaning it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I want to sneak a couple Cooper specific questions in and then we'll, we'll close with uh, Rogue Squadron, but I know we're, we're coming to the end of our time and I want to make sure that um, we get these in because you, you've you talked a lot about how influential your time at Cooper was. So I, there are some folks who I think want to know who were your who were your painting and film professors at Cooper? Can you remember a particular crit that for better or worse, you still return to? Oh my God. I wish I had brushed up on everybody's last names. <laughs> What's Nikki's last name? Who was my sculpture teacher who was so wonderful? Uh, not at Cooper yeah. anymore, but. I know she was, she's wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, Margaret Morton was a photography teacher of mine. Um, Robert Breer was an incredible, you know, film professor who really, you know, he, he hilariously told me right from the start that he was like, I am not the teacher for you. Cause he was <laughs> talking about sand brackage and installation visuals, not storytelling. Um, Ross, Ross McLaren was there who was, who was just starting out there at Cooper, who is still there now, I believe. And um, there were lots and lots of people. I had so many brutal, here's an interesting thing. Here's an interesting story because this, this is a Cooper thing that has very much led to, to where I am. At that time, conceptual art was very in style. 
I was really craving this big emotional game. And so I was doing paintings and things that were like movie posters. They were like big emotional drawings. And um, I remember seeing how vulnerable and difficult that road was going to be because it because you just get ripped to shreds because everything you do is cheesy and silly when it's not perfect, you know, and you're vulnerable to being called that regardless of what you do because you're you're doing something where you're trying at emotion and you're not necessarily succeeding for everyone. And I just remember having that moment where I even had conversations about it with professors where I was like trying to get at something and not quite knowing how to do it yet. And I remember that moment you were talking about where I stood at the cube and I was like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I was like, I was thinking about Superman and I was like, one day I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna get my hands on the big emotions and I want to be brave enough to do them. You know, I want, I want to, by that period of time, just go forward, no matter what people can say or do, because they're always, somebody's always going to say it's cheesy if you do anything that's vulnerable or emotional, like that's the easiest way to slam things. So I think you have, you have to just go into it saying like, I, I want to give that feeling to other people. And I think the critiques at Cooper and making you clarify that that's what you were after and that's the road you were going to go on is was were such a huge part of that and 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 defend you know having to defend what you're doing to great artists who are really real artists doing great work in the world i know lots of people are curious about the transition from cooper where you did a lot of painting into film um, can you talk a little bit about that transition kind of how you made it what, what got you there how you thought about it Man, it was a long road. It was such a long road. Although uh, at Cooper, I feel like I learned how to be an artist and I learned how to, what the discipline of an artist is, decide what you're doing, figure out how to do it, apply the technical things that you learn how to do and then try to achieve the, the, the outcome. Basically, that's exactly what I did. It just took 12, 12 years, you know? It, it literally, from the moment I graduated from Cooper, every single thing in those, I guess, 10 years until, I, yeah, 10 years from the time I graduated from Cooper to when I made Monster. Every single one of those things was a chapter of that. Like it just took me that long to like learn my craft, figure out what my objective was, come up with a cohesive plan to get there and then get the opportunity to, to, to be funded to do it. So that's the easiest way to say it is like, I was learned about camera. I worked on set all the, every day for th those years. Then I went to AFI and I really focused on just what it was I wanted to say and do in the world and, cr and, and the craft of filmmaking in, in a, as an art form. Um, and then I, and then I finally got to make a film. <laughs> um, uh, so huge congratulations to you and to the franchise um, that you were named of Rogue Squadron. You. Um, you will be the first woman to direct a Star Wars film. Can you put that in perspective for the next generation of aspiring directors here at Cooper and elsewhere? You know what's interesting? Thank you so much for that. I'm so honored to get to play in this sandbox, just, just as I, I, I still can't quite believe I'm the person that got to make Wonder Woman and what an incredible honor. And like now, you know, Star Wars, it's like that was a, a definitive moment in my life was seeing Star Wars for the first time and what that meant throughout my youth. So it's an incredible thing to get to do it. I, um, I think what's interesting to me is I never ever, it was interesting that I was thinking about Superman so much when I was thinking about filmmaking. Literally, I never thought about becoming a big filmmaker. All of the films that I had really been most influenced by in my teenage years and by, when I was at Cooper were art house films. And so I think what's interesting to me is now that I'm here, I realize storytelling is storytelling and some of the greatest artists of all are in this high echelon of major IP tent poles. Some of them are not, but a lot of them are, you know, like the people that you get to work with on this level are profound artists. They're the best in the business oftentimes. And so I don't think you have to choose between I'm an artist or I'm commercial. I feel like Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 1984 were as personal to me as Monster was. And so I, I think that, um, 
I think that opening one's mind to, to the fact that great art can happen at every level. And, and, and I now admire the great artists who were making massive tent poles and influencing the world in such a different way than I, than I knew to say out loud when I was a kid, you know, why? Because we still know every line from their movie. So that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing art, you know, like it's not just commercial, it's art, it's stuck with you. And so that would be the only thing I would say is like the sky is the limit of what art, what art can, can be, you know? And so to embrace, you don't have to choose. You, you can embrace applying your, the artist in you all over the place in this world. Uh, what, what a, an important and compelling note to end on. I, I just, you know, I hear those words and you are just this living, breathing, dynamic manifestation of so much of what Cooper Union is about, right? Not shying away from the complexity, really pushing the envelope, holding true to your conviction while being open to all of this feedback. It's just, it's been incredible to watch your career. We are, as I've always said, so incredibly um, proud of, of what you're doing and so grateful for it. I mean, you are using your media to really influence the world for good. And um, that is such a gift to all of us. I can't thank you enough for it. Thank you, Laura. And I just want to add a tiny thing back for anybody that's tuning in here that doesn't know about Cooper. I would just, I would encourage you to read about this school. It's a school that was a you know, uh, uh, founded by uh, uh, someone with a huge amount of money comparable to a billionaire in this day and age, and who took his money and started a, cool, uh, a school that would allow women and, and minorities of all kinds to get an education for free. And that legacy has continued and it, we're trying to get it back to being free now. So believing in what the school stands for and, and, um, and what it did in the world, it changed my life. I could not, I don't, you know, I, I don't know how I could have gotten this education elsewhere. So, you know, get, in, get involved and any little donation would be super appreciated. Thank you so much, Patty. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. This has just been an incredible conversation. Um, so grateful to have a, a glimpse into the work, um, to all of the behind the scenes thought that goes into it, all the technical aspects and the relationships and, and the ways in which these films are really impacting the world. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Good thank night, you. everyone. Thank you again.